So then let's actually look a little more into apps and services. So this is uh, relatively current data about how the different Android versions are being used at the moment. So um, this is uh, accesses to the Play Store from last week. And um, as you can see, I'm sorry, as you can see, um, so the newest versions like Marshmallow and Lollipop don't really make up more than half of all devices that are currently running. If you count in KitKat, then you're getting to maybe three quarters. Um, but if you want to cover a really large uh, percentage of Android devices, then you have to include everything uh, maybe up to 4.1. Uh, or down to 4.1, actually. So um, the problem is that many device vendors don't really provide a lot of support for their devices. They just sell them and never basically touch them again afterwards, so they will never get an, an update. Google has been trying to, to push the, the device vendors to provide app updates for at least two years, but that's not been not that uh, successful. So what Google is now trying to do is to move um, as many things as possible out of the core Android OS, which is installed by the vendor and doesn't often get updates, and instead move them into uh, services that are installed via the store. And if it's installed like an app via the store, then you can update it. Uh, then Google can update it on any device and they don't have to rely on the, on the vendor anymore. So um, here's a, a rough overview of where the different uh, components are actually coming from. So the central Android um, uh, operating system contains only actually very few uh, very simple apps anymore. For example, the ca calculator and the clock and of course um, the R ART itself, the application framework, um, the Linux kernel, hardware support, uh, notification, settings, and so on. So the, only the most central uh, components are actually still part of Android. Then on top of that, we have the Google Play services, which is actually more or less just an app installed via the Play Store. Um, which contains a lot more things, different APIs, uh, uh, cloud messaging, photo synchronization, the malware scanner, location stuff, maps, all of this is part of this Google Play services component, which can be updated by Google um, while the store. And on top of that, we have lots of different uh, other apps like Google Maps itself, different keyboards, um, Google Plus, Gmail, I don't know, Chrome, the camera app. All of these are simply apps which you can install from the store and which can also be updated um, by Google. But the, the central uh, uh, strategy from Google is at the moment to move as many things as possible from the uh, core operating system into these play services so they don't depend on the, on the vendors as much anymore. So, but this helps to let new apps be compatible with old Android versions. Exactly. But most of the performance issues are based in the Android OS, right? Exactly, exactly. So it doesn't, uh, it doesn't help too much with performance because, for example, the runtime is still part of the core operating system. So if you want to have performance improvements, then you basically need to update the, the core operating system and uh, because actually these play services also run on top of, of ART. Um, so you can have basically better backward compatibility for, for apps for older devices, but the performance may be just bad then. So that's still a problem. Okay, so... Now let's switch to a slightly different topic in terms of apps and native apps because there's actually a third option between having native code 
uh, and virtual machine, Java-based code. You can, of course, also have um, HTML5-based apps, so to say. Um, they have a couple of advantages and disadvantages. The big advantages, of course, that you don't need to install them. You don't need to pull them off the uh, off the Play Store and spend maybe some of your of your data budget on that. Um, you just need an URL that can be maybe even an NFC tag, so you can just touch your phone somewhere and the the app starts. Um, you can also. Uh, directly have cross-platform support with HTML5. You can have uh, support for iOS maybe and even for desktops. Um, the problem is, of course, or one of the problems is that the perf performance is generally not as good because you have simply another layer of indirection because everything runs inside the web browser, which is in, in itself an app. And uh, then you need a JavaScript interpreter and so on. Um, Another problem is that you uh, can't access uh, hardware or sensors as well in the browser. It's possible, but it's, uh, it's a lot m more convol convoluted than um, in a native app. So you can actually do image processing in JavaScript with live camera images. Uh, it's possible, but it's really slow, of course. Um, and JavaScript is being optimized all the time, so maybe this gap will be closing at some point, but right now it's still uh, quite a big performance issue. And what's also, of course, a problem is that you, uh, now that you have different browsers, like you can have Firefox or Chrome or uh, WebKit stuff on iOS, um, Safari for, uh, it's called, then you will again need some kind either some kind of compatibility layer or you will have to, to build these kind of browsers, which is again where you check which browser is it and then do something different every time. So HTML5 apps have pros and cons. Um, on the other hand, if you compare them to native apps, it's more or less exactly the opposite. They're generally faster. This is difficult to quantify if you just have a very simple app where you can enter some text and have a few buttons and fields, then it probably won't make a big difference. If you have a game or something with image processing, then the, uh, the native app is probably faster. And by native, I now mean anything that's being developed with the SDK or NDK. No, doesn't actually matter if it contains native code in the in the narrow sense. Native app is anything built as an APK, basically. Um, of course, you can also have better access to to the hardware and to the uh, Android services. So, for example, if you want to uh, actually uh, have users pay for something, then this is a lot easier in a native app because then you can just um, do the whole payment process via the Play Store. Um, in HTML5, you would have to, to implement some link to PayPal or something like that, maybe. Um, on the other hand, um, big drawback, of course, is that you need to install them. Maybe download 10 or 20 megabytes which you, for just one single function. Um, Interestingly, for the upcoming Android uh, N, I think is the next the next letter. They are there's there are some plans to support. Um, I can't remember the exact name right now, but it's basically a feature where you can uh, only download part of an app, like one specific activity. Um, when you just need it for for five minutes and you don't actually need to install the uh, the entire app, then you can just download one small part of the app, use that for five minutes, and then basically throw it away again. So that that's trying to, to remove that limitation that you always need to install the whole thing um, and bring it a little closer to HTML5, where you just have to download whatever you, you want to interact with right now. But uh, this was just part of the developer preview, so uh, it's, it remains to be seen if that will actually end up in the final version of Android M. And of course, uh, as far as I understood it, um, developers will have to 
uh, to modify the app somehow so that will actually become possible. So it's not something that will work right out of the box. But it's still uh, uh, moving, moving the native apps a little closer to the advantages of HTML5 apps. So um, the big trade-off and a very simplified one uh, would be that if you have uh, very simple apps and that maybe should even be cross-platform for um, iOS and Android and it doesn't matter if they don't work offline, then you can maybe go for HTML5. Uh, there are actually are different frameworks which you can use to, um, to basically create one HTML5 page that will then work on all sorts of mobile devices. But if you need um, performance, maybe 3D graphics, access to hardware, um, then the native app is generally uh, a better bet. Again, this is a very rough, rough rule of thumb, but uh, right now I think it's still mostly valid. Um, so now let's go back just once more to um, the different, yeah, oh, question, please. Uh, I find this, this term HTML, HTML5 app a little bit confusing because is it really an app or well, yeah, no, um, I would just program a responsive website? Yes, that's, that's actually what I meant basically by saying app here. So it's, uh, I was just, uh, using that term to describe some closed, clo uh, some set of websites belonging together. Let's put it like that. So that's in HTML5 terms. Yeah, responsive website would probably be the right term. Phone gap, yeah. Mm -hmm, exactly, exactly, yeah. Phone gap is a good example. Or Xamarin, I think, is also there. So there's different kinds of frameworks which basically work on that level and which try to make it easier to, to create uh, some kind of, of yeah, responsive website which works on most devices. Um, 